So as this is a dialogue, and uh, after meeting some of you, has been introduced to you before the uh, before the presentation today. Then I understand that uh, quite a number of you are quite are known experts or gurus in your own particular field. And as you can see from my own CV, that was uh, that was. Uh, summarized by Jules earlier, agriculture is probably the area that I know the least. <laughs> so let's make this into a collaborative effort, and that's the purpose of the dialogue. So feel free to jump in during the presentation. So let's uh, a dialogue comprised of a two-way traffic, or even a three-way, four-way traffic. So that's a conversation. Now before I start, Let's do some role playing. Yeah. Let's just assume for a second, because good economists always try to uh, start with an assumption. So let's just assume for a second that I'm the Department of Energy uh, Secretary, newly appointed to the job, knows nothing about agriculture, knows very little about energy, but probably knows a bit about how policy is formulated. So I'm just opening the floor to everybody because I'm seeking your advice. As a policy maker, what are the things that I need to focus on? Who wants to start? Social significance. Social significance. Social significance. Okay. Anything else? Okay, let's be specific. If I want to launch a bioenergy program or a renewable energy program, what are the things that I need to focus on as Secretary of Energy? Station, maybe one of them. Yeah. Income. Yeah, income. No, let, me, let me use a different uh, color for that. use a short time of CO2 to mean uh, pollution and any contaminants. Okay. Because that seems to be the language of uh, environment. What else? My, our secular energy would be very, very, uh, would have a lot of time to spare. <laughs> what else should I be focusing on as secretary of energy? Means what? Money. Uh, 
consumer products, but rather the future of the company lies in infrastructure, lies in uh, energy, and you know, before you know it, after, after acquiring Petron and acquiring uh, Meralpa, well no, Meralpa is uh, Pangilina. The next step is to move into the whole energy opportunity of which biodiesel, renewable energy would be one of So imagine now that I am the chairman of San Miguel, Ramon An. What would you advise me to do or to focus on? Okay. As an investor. Profits. should be doing, but he's not doing. And therefore, should do something about it. Yes, Jules. I was, I was thinking sustainability. Sustainability? Of what? Uh, all the other, all the technologies, but I think that fits into choices of technology also. Sustainability of uh, the technology that would be chosen. So I think it fits there already. So, Mr. Ran will be very, very, uh, will be playing golf uh, most of the day. Yes. These are the only two things he needs to worry mm -hmm. about. Profit. That's, that's big enough. Because Profit. It's going to entail a lot of uh, decisions already. His, his costs, yeah. his uh, revenues. And, uh, and his revenues will be affected by what government uh, will do. Like, uh, if he's going to be taxed, then this profit will. Okay. So government yeah. relations is one of them? Yes, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. Whatever the government does will affect his bottom line, it is uh, profit. Yeah. So what I will add to this is risk. And I think the variance in the language of statistics and finance 
let's uh, just put variance as a uh, you know, as one of the uh, one of the things uh, to remind us. Now, let's now leave the role play and let's come back to this list on the board uh, from time to time. And I guess you know. I'll add another thing here, which is probably summarizing what some of the points on sustainability uh, would probably have covered, yes. which is the language of wealth creation, whereas in the case of uh, policy, what we talk about is the language of welfare. And the language of the language of allocation. Now, before we before we dive deep into the uh, in today's presentation, I just want to clarify a couple of concepts. Yeah. One is when we talk about policy, at least for our purposes today, and that's the uh, the context of the paper is written on. Is that policy refers to the coercive power of government. Because even San Miguel Corporation, the most powerful corporation in the Philippines, does not have the sufficient influence or the power that the government has, which is the coercive power to tax and the coercive power to allocate. Yeah. Meaning, the government can provide money or could take away yeah, money to the benefit or to the detriment of any industry. Now, in the language of economics, economics simply refers to what are some of the motivations and the purpose of business. The purpose of business is to create profits and to create wealth. Yeah. And that's the language of wealth creation. Now, so far, what we have seen is CO2 taxation, penalties, subsidies, and granting of funds, uh, which come from the, uh, from the government. It's oftentimes premise on one very simple concept. The government needs to be seen to be doing something. Yeah. Whatever that something is, is probably premise on providing predictability yeah, as an enabling environment for economics to prosper, yeah, for business to prosper. Now, so this is where policy making probably have a tough job yeah, in trying to do what business, uh, what business would be looking for, yeah, which is, if your starting assumption is this is a straight and linear process because the world appears to operate in a straight and linear process, at least your colleagues in business schools around the world would probably have been taught for either 12 months or 24 months to talk about net present value, to talk about internal rate of return. Yeah. You assume a certain price, you assume a certain cost base, there's a revenue, cash flow comes out of it, then that present value automatically is spat out by your computer in an Excel file. Yeah. Now, somehow that linear way of thinking and the linear way of looking at the world yeah, influence policy making as well. Especially in an area where you say, if renewable energy and biodiesel is perceived to always be more expensive yeah, than conventional fuels or conventional technology, then the way to encourage the deployment of bioenergy, that's renewable power, biodiesel, biofuels, ethanol, what, what have you, then the only way you can make it work and make it competitive with oil is what? is to subsidize. Therefore, what is government trying to do here? 
government is trying to be the capitalist and the regulator at the same time. Yeah. Two roles that will start to struggle yeah. the areas of focus of policy and the areas of focus of economics. Now, in some countries it works, in some countries it doesn't. In most cases, it doesn't, unfortunately. Now, the other influence on policy is our good friend Malthus. I'm sure most of you probably still remember the good old Reverend Malthus, or I guess in economic circles, he's probably more better known as a philosopher, Malthus. So Malthus simply says that population grows geometrically while food production increases in a linear fashion. And therefore, there will come a time where the population would outstrip the growth in, a, in food. And the only consequence for that is disaster. Now, let's try to connect this to the linear way of thinking you know, that somehow has influenced policy and economics, which is Ceteris paribus is the other economic assumptions that we always make. And for those of you who have learned your Latin, it is simply saying all things remain equal. Yeah. Unfortunately, the world do not always operate on the virtues of a Ceteris paribus world, yeah. because what is behind the assumption of Malthus is that technology doesn't change. Now, so what are some of the disastrous consequences of the Malthusian logic, which is flowed, but somehow has influenced policy? Let's go back to the United Kingdom, 1865. Probably a fellow which is not so well known, is called Jevons, yeah, Stanley Jevons. Well, at least in UK circle, yeah, he would have been very well known for his, uh, for his paper called The Cold Question. So that's why the ironic thing about Malthusian theory and the flowed logic of Malthus, it seems to find some realization in energy rather than in food production. Yeah. Because the experience of the last 200, 300 years has somehow debunked the Malthusian theory as far as agribusiness business is concerned. Although now it has become more fashionable again to talk about peak oil, it's fashionable to talk about limits to resources. So Jevons' argument was essentially saying coal is the only resource that we know of to fuel mobility and to fuel heat. So in other words, transport and cooking and shelter is going to be powered by coal. And coal is the only resource that will be available. And because coal is running out, or the world is running out of coal, the UK has to dig deeper and deeper in order to make coal viable, in order to extract more coal out of the ground, yeah, to the point that there's only one consequence to that, which is the UK as the imperial, dominant imperial power of the 19th century, is doomed to fail as an empire. Well, up to that part of the prediction, he was probably quite right. Yeah. The second part of the prediction is that only misery could end as far as the UK, the UK model is concerned. Because it is inconceivable to think of any other form of technology other than coal. Yeah. Now, we go back to some of the assumptions we have here. You see, there is Paribus, right? We are trying to project the present to try to understand the future. We are trying to project from the present knowledge to basically predict what the future shape of the world would look like. Now, as a consequence of that, well, we know that the British Empire has fallen. 
we know that the British Empire no longer exists. But we also do know that aside from coal, nuclear technology came in, oil came in, gas came in, and God forbid in the UK, offshore wind farms are starting to come up. I, I said, God forbid, because the British are rather particular about visual pollution. Now, so the kind of policy that emerged from that, unfortunately, is to throw more money into the problem. And the only way to follow Japan's argument, instead of digging deeper and deeper for more and more expensive coal to make the equation work, well, the way, sub the way subsidies could make economics viable is to have a spiraling amount of subsidies to make, to make the new technologies work in a dynamic, in a dynamic environment. And some of that example is already visited. So these are some of the least cost choices of the technologies. Now this is calculating the, uh, what we call the levelized cost of energy. And again, there's nothing magic or mysterious about levelized cost of energy. Yeah. For our purposes today, just think of, on a long-term basis, yeah, after making all the adjustments for cycles and cyclical uh, terms, that is the normalized level of the cost of energy according to different technologies. So, now if we have to talk about choices of technology as one of Mr. Ang's uh, priorities, how do you think Mr. Ang would focus his business called San Miguel Corporation? Okay, just following a linear mindset wherein everything is predictable. Essentially, Mr. Ah will be looking at this and say, I'll probably look at combined cycle, I'll probably look at coal, because those are the more, shall we say, the cheaper, cheaper technology to supply my, my energy. And I will not pass photovoltaic and maybe I will look at some of the wind farms, some of the biomass, yeah, and some of the bio, bio energy or biofuels, which again, in this chart, which show up as distributed power generation. Now, so, if that is the mindset of economics, What would, they, what would they be looking for? If you want to let the water flow up to the mountain instead of letting the, the water flow down the mountain, how do you encourage Mr. Ram to consider the less viable or the more expensive technologies? Well, Mr. Ram will probably go to the Secretary of Energy, or maybe the Governor of the Board of Investment, and say, if you give me subsidies, yeah, I might consider that. Better still, give me a little bit of fiscal incentives. Yeah. Well, so the BLI Governor will probably say, so how many years of tax exemption do you want to have? Oh, well, if you can give me tax exemption for 25 years, well and good, right? Yeah. Now, I'm not sure if there is a market for biofuels. I'm not sure there's a market for renewable energy. Yeah. So, I'd like you to mandate a quota. And my objective at the end of the day is to have a very secure returns for my business. Yeah. But
But why am I doing this? I'm doing this because I'm looking at every particular investment as a standalone investment. And so basically, I say, well, you want me to build a wind farm? Great. Yeah. This is a subsidy that I need to make it work. This is the quota that I need so that every time the wind is blowing, yeah, you make sure yeah, that Naralco takes it yeah, or avoid this power takes it. And so the end result here is a blurring of the boundaries. So what is the role of government? in this particular model. The role of government is a social entrepreneur. Yeah. With one big difference though, a social entrepreneur that does not participate in the research. Yeah. It's a great investment, isn't it? Now, public policy is quite obliging. Because we now all believe in a global consensus encouraged by the United Nations in the persona of Pachauri, probably less well known than his counterpart on the political field, Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth. Now to be awarded with the Nobel Prize uh, Award, you know, that's, that's some recognition, right? So, you have fill-in tariff. Yeah, fill-in tariff is just a way of, uh, if a normal, conventional uh, electricity is priced at, I don't know, how much is Philippine electricity, how much are you paying for electricity? Yeah. Five pesos per kilowatt hour, or? or six pesos per kilowatt hour. So you say, if you're renewable, then I'll pay you uh, two pesos more. Yeah. So instead of five, you get seven, or instead of six, you get eight. Now, the quota, I think we mentioned that, CO2 taxation, a few countries are doing that. Yeah. The CO2 taxation is just the flip side of the feed-in tariff. So, Feed-in tariff is simply assuming that we know what the future looks like because what we know what today looks like. Therefore, we can bet on the technology that's likely to win tomorrow. So we say, yeah, wind is great. Yeah, solar, probably quite some way to go. Yeah, biomass, biofuels, these are good, good technologies. So we'll subsidize them. So you're actually betting on a winner. The downside of that is in 10 years' time, I do not know which of these technologies will still be around. Given the pace of technological change, some of the technologies that we know today may not be around. And worse, the technologies that will solve tomorrow's problem, just like in Jevons' time, <coughs> But they couldn't conceive of anything other than coal, yeah. the nuclear equivalent of a technology breakthrough yeah, might emerge. It may or may not emerge. Yeah. Now on the other side, you have CO2 taxation. Yeah, this is just a measure where you say, I know what the dirty technologies are. I know I don't want pollution. And more or less, I have certain, a certain feel that these technologies will probably still be around in 10, 20 years time. So, this is the penalty side of the subsidy scheme. So you basically say, if you, subs if you subsidize renewable, the flip side of that is you penalize the polluters, yeah. the concept of polluters pay. Now, so the effects on power prices would remain the same. Yeah. 
you put a CO2 tax on fossil fuel, that means the gasoline price that you put into your tank will go up. The power prices that powers air conditioning would go up. Now with higher prices, then the parity between renewable and conventional power and conventional fuels would start to work out. And this is where the dynamics of the economic system yeah, would drive your technology choices. At this stage, any questions at this stage? Before we move to uh, an entirely new territory. So therefore, because of our good friend Malthus, well, there's a limit to resources. And the culture being taken by our good friend Jevons, and more recently, Pachauri yeah, of the UN IPCC, or Inter, uh, Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. Yeah. So there's a limit to resources, then you need to have, you need to make a choice whether you produce food or you produce fuel within the amount of land that you have. So limits to growth is an example of that kind of logic. Now, what amused me about this cartoon is that there seems to be a crossover role here. So oftentimes what you find is that the farmer would probably, during the depression times in the United States, would probably knock at everybody's door and say, well, can I work for you in exchange for food? And so now we have the machine telling the pump to say, well, can you fill me up in exchange for food? <laughs> yeah, so that's probably an example of, coal, of a fuel versus food dilemma, yeah. inspired pretty much by a flawed logic, inspired by, by our good friend Malthus. Now let us examine what the outside world really looks like. Instead of a straight linear world where everything is predictable or could be made predictable by policy, we are actually operating in a very dynamic, uncertain and unpredictable world. Now, this is now the time to throw up our hands and say, well, I give up, you know. Four years of economics in UP, uh, two years of MBA, uh, uh, maybe I don't know how many how many years it, it took you to, to get your PhD. Yeah. Now, here's somebody telling me that uh, forecasting is rather an impossible job. But unfortunately, that is the kind of world that we're dealing with. Yeah. This is not a world that would easily fit into the schema that things, because we assume certain things to happen, then the world out there would necessarily cooperate and deliver the goods. Yeah. So, so let's examine how this dynamic and uncertain world actually operates and influences our technology choices. Back in the 1860s, uh, 1860s, just about the time of Germany, <coughs> coal was emerging as a dominant fuel, replacing wood chips yeah, as the principal fuel, which uh, took about 80 percent of the market. Now, how did old King Coal diminish its dominance over time? Well, the surprising thing for me is it had nothing to do with scarcity. It had nothing to do with government subsidies. The shift from coal to oil has all to do with some of the technological decisions 
that some people made, yeah? which is the emergence of the combustion engine, uh, engines adopted by what's the what's the what's the best known uh, car brand uh, that you could think of, which is not Japanese. The Ford. Japanese Ford. were not producing Ford. cars then. Ford. Yeah. Edison Ford at that time simply said, "Combustion engine is the way forward." So I'm going to adopt combustion engine. Now, were there alternatives to the combustion engine at that time? Yes, there were better technologies at the time. So you thought that fuel cells is a, is a recent invention? That was a choice at that time. Yeah. And the combustion engine was not exactly the most ideal and the most efficient uh, technology available. But because there was a commitment in the development of combustion engines, oil started to replace coal. Now, what happened to gas in the 1990s? Opening up the market for gas exploration, response to the crisis of oil crisis of 1973, and more importantly, what happened in the 1990s? Two things. Electricity power, privatization, and liberalization. Yeah. Whatever you think about it, good or bad. Yeah. I'm partly guilty or take part of the credit for that. And the other thing is the development and the emergence of the combined cycle gas turbine technology. What made CCGT so attractive under a competitive environment? Cheaper, cheap to build, quick to build. It takes about three years to build a combined cycle. How many years does it take to build a nuclear plant? 10 years. And you'll be lucky to get a nuclear plant at the end of the day. Yeah. Well, Philippines took longer. But that's a different story. Now, I combine that with gas being abundantly available at the time, yeah, CCGT became the technology of choice. Now again, what did subsidy and scarcity play in that transition? I leave that question for you to uh, to think about and to consider, you know, beyond the end of this uh, session. Now, the renewables, electricity cars, those are something that are emerging in the horizon. And of course, in 10 years' time, if we look back at this chart, we might see something very similar to what we have today, or something that is radically different. So. Now, mandated fuels, again, this is from the Philippines. And, uh, and if we had to achieve a 10% blend for biofuels in the Philippines, that implies from the 2009 production level, we would probably need to increase by how many times? Maybe 20 times, right? To achieve the Philippine target. Now the other regional countries are similarly placed to meet that kind of challenge. And that's probably one of the reasons that people are struggling, or policymakers and investors are struggling to think about where the opportunities are. Because we're still thinking in a very linear world and still believe in a Malthusian logic. Now, what is the flip side of this chart? The nice, thing about, the nice thing about statistics is you can look at it as a half full glass or a half empty glass. Now the pessimist would say, this is an impossible task. Forget it. You know, Mr. Secretary of Energy, go home, pack up your bags. You know, spend your time playing golf. 
or you can say that there is actually a regional market that's emerging. If we are to be serious about meeting these uh, mandated targets, this is equivalent to policy creating a demand for the product. So you can either say this is an impossible task or this is an opportunity that is waiting to be exploited. Now, so what happened in what happened in the Philippines? I thought, with our objective of achieving national autarky for fuel, meaning self-sufficiency for oil, that's why we have all the subsidies and mandated volumes. Yeah. This is the experience since 2005. Did did we manage to create our industry as policy intended? Or was the latter view actually more spot on when it comes to exploiting the opportunity? Again, something to think about. I think Rex just came from here, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, interestingly, our neighbors appear to be a lot quicker in seeing that as an opportunity as opposed to the stance that unfortunately economics seems to have taken in a country like the Philippines, which is to rely on a rent seeking model of extracting returns. So what does, what does that lead us to? It leads us to ask the question, in what business are you in? If you're in the biofuels business, what is your business? To use a business school uh, lingo, what is your business model? How do you make money? You don't have to try. Okay. All we're saying here is that if you have, if you break down your revenue stream. Your revenue stream is a small part selling fuels, a big part which is cost of producing that fuel, and the gap plus the returns is covered by, you get it, subsidies. So is this a fuel business? Is this an energy business? Or is this a rent extraction business? Yeah. And the mechanism to extract the rent is putting a, a refinery or actually a blending facility. Now, well, thanks for this. It's not too bad. You know, the Philippines import a lot of these biofuels because that simply shows that there is a viable market in the Philippines. Yeah. And a market to be supplied by import or domestic production, and the two will need to coexist and compete with one another yeah. as a transition point, as a, as a bridge to the future opportunities. Meaning, if you cannot supply today, how can you import it? Yeah. And then let's try to create our own production base that would at least be competitive with imports. So the same experience that we have in biofuels, for not a single country that I'm aware of, has ever come close to achieving the mandated targets. Renewable power is the same story. Yeah. Now the critical benchmark is a 5% penetration rate, because if you look back to that energy transition chart, you need about 5% penetration rate you know, before you enter into a phase of sustained growth and sustained adaptation. Yeah. Or in business school language or economic language, that's a point where you get into critical mass. Yeah. 
actually, except for the five countries, the rest of the world is so far behind, 15 years after a regime of heavy subsidies and heavy support, and almost even to the point of government becoming social investors. Now, if you start looking at this as a rent extraction business as opposed to a power business, then the outcome that we have had, at least in Europe, well, the reason I couldn't, uh, I couldn't present uh, the map in other parts of the world is that wind farm deployment in other parts of the world is hardly non-existent. So the only places where wind farms are of some substance is actually in Europe and in the US. Well, we do have 30 megawatt in the locals, but that's, uh, that, hardly, that hardly figures in the statistics. It's a rounding error. So you have a mismatch between the area, which is colored blue and red. Those are the most favorable. Those are the most favorable uh, sites for wind farms. The green and the yellow are the less favorable sites. Now, interestingly enough, the green, which is Germany and Spain, are the ones with the higher deployment than Scotland or the UK. And the UK only managed to get the wind farm up, which is the biggest in Europe now, after 11 years of licensing. Because as it so happened, they thought Scottish power did the job. Of course, without quite realizing that Scottish power is actually owned by a company called Iberdrola, who happens to be Spanish, and who happens to be the world leader in renewable energy uh, and conventional power. So that's a rather a pity to skew policy and economics in this way. So in this sad situation, how do we reframe, or how do we turn this uh, sad situation into some kind of an opportunity? Well, I would say we have to reframe the investment uh, dilemma. This is not a food versus fuel dilemma. This is a food, fuel, and trade dilemma, uh, opportunity, not a dilemma. Now, the subtext of that is, as opposed to what Pimentel, not the center, but rather Pimentel or Cornell, is saying about the north-south uh, divide or the exploited capitalists yeah, gaining at the expense of the poor south. Yeah. So therefore, you have a, a welfare economics dilemma uh, to solve. What I would say. Those are actually secondary issues. Yeah. I know this is provocative, yeah. especially saying this in a forum like this. But it is secondary as an issue, as we will find a few slides later on. Yeah. Because we need to focus on what the role of government is and what the role of economics is, and, this, and the hierarchy, yeah, and the hierarchy of needs. So in other words, the analogy that I could think of really is, there are two kinds of people in this world, in the same way that there are probably two kinds of policy makers in this world. One group of people would say, I aspire to be happy. So I seek happiness as an objective. Equivalent for policy is, I aspire to maximize welfare, therefore I seek to maximize welfare. The other group of people is probably the pragmatic type, which would say, I do things that fulfills me, and because I do things that is fulfilling, in the process I become happy. 
So, in Polish you speak, I do things or institute policies that will ensure that prosperity is delivered because with prosperity, I have a better chance of enhancing the welfare of society. So, two different views. So the reframing of the food, fuel, and trade opportunity belongs to the latter part. I don't seek to be happy as an objective, but I'd rather focus on the mechanisms that deliver prosperity. So, what is the agribusiness value chain? All I'm presenting here is, if we understand what the full spectrum of the agribusiness activity is, then we probably have a better chance of getting out yeah, of the Malthusian trap. In a field, we can produce food, yeah, and I think most of you would be more familiar with that, or be very familiar and experts in your own right. So you plant sugar cane, uh, you produce, uh, as a result of that, you produce sugar that could be used for processing, that could be used to produce food products. Now, but sugar cane not only produce the cane sugar, it also produces bagasse, it also produces waste, it also produces other stuff. Now, all those other stuff could either be using the, the primary product, which is sugar, for fermentation into alcohol. So you have a bioethanol type of, uh, of use. And this is probably where the food versus fuel kind of debate appears to come in. But at the same time, we do have the waste, which is present is probably burned in the field and not utilized. Now, that could be used as a feedstock for biogas or biogas power production. Now, so, uh, from a policy perspective, I think the framework is oftentimes, at least in my humble opinion, mistakenly yeah, trying to optimize the whole value chain, when in reality, there are parts of the value chain that probably policy do not need to, to do anything about. For example, the choice of whether to sell to the food producers or the fuel producers, that is probably a decision that is best left to Mr. Ang rather than to the Secretary of Energy. Now, whether you want to uh, improve the infrastructure to support the logistics. That is not Mr. Ang's decision. That is probably where the Secretary of Highways, the Secretary of Public Works, working with the Department of Energy, working with the other agencies, would probably be in a better position to deliver. Yeah. So, example again of specialization of the roads. Now, in terms of single technology, now the single income rate is, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with, uh, with this formula called returns minus weighted average cost of capital. Or I think colloquially, in the practitioner's journal, it's called economic value added. Yeah, yeah so uh, in other words, The returns minus the cost of the capital deployed. Yeah. If it's positive, you're creating value. If it's negative, you're destroying value. Now, in academic literature that has been in existence since the 19th century, and that's what is called residual income. Now, all we're saying here is that the horizontal line is the different oil prices across the uh, across the spectrum. Now if we just assume on a satirist paradox basis, 
and just say, policy is assuming a long-term oil price of $70 per barrel, and we base our subsidies on that basis, then of course we will be operating in this area of comparison, ignoring the areas where you have low oil prices or the areas where you have high oil prices. Now, so for single technology, yeah, remember the basis of the subsidy is trying to close the gap on a single project, on a single technology. So you basically take the difference and say, what would make it attractive to an investor? So the subsidy is the plug number yeah, to make the uh, to make the NPV or the IRR works. Now, unfortunately, or fortunately for business, renewable energy. And conventional fuels actually have a very different cost structures. And this is where the strength and the diversity within a portfolio becomes quite interesting. Because if you want to cover yourself yeah, against oil price volatility, what do you do? Yeah. What do you do to cover yourself against oil price uh, volatility? Now, if you believe, if you believe the newspaper headline, yeah, this government's response is to do what? Let's create a price stabilization facility, yeah, so that when oil price goes up, we throw money into it. So, so what's the government doing? Throw more pesos into the problem. Now, the reality is there are two kinds of technology. The fossil fuel technologies that become more expensive as oil prices go up and they become cheaper when oil prices are low. Then you have renewable energy where the fuel cost is, is what? What's the cost of wind? What's the cost of water? What's the cost of geothermal? Zero. Yeah? Whether oil prices is at 120 or oil prices is at 80 or at 14, the fuel cost curve is a straight line. Now, if you combine that within the same portfolio, so all of a sudden, what you find is that the combination of coal, combination of gas with wind, with geothermal within the same portfolio will give you a break-even break price which is significantly lower than a single technology, uh, a single technology investment. And this is where I think later on I'd like to ask you about the experience of San Carlos, which is an example of a single technology type of investment, divorced yeah, from, uh, from the rest of the value chain in the aggregates. Although I think from our conversation, you seem to suggest that they are doing the portfolio picking up. So if the break even price for oil is lower, that simply means you need less subsidies to make this work because there are natural hedges yeah, that somehow corrects itself. So implications for subsidies? If we set subsidies at this stage, yeah, and the subsidy would be the red straight line and the blue line going up, yeah, those are just two different assumptions on how subsidies is being uh, being granted, yeah. the straight line is a fixed, fixed subsidy, and the blue rising line is the uh, is a variable subsidy, yeah. depending on the price. 
So there are contradictions here on how subsidies work. Because at high oil prices, the amount of subsidies that you need, actually these three lines here, are calculated by saying how much return are they getting at that oil price level? And how much is conventional fuel making at that oil price? And the difference is the subsidy. Yeah. Remember, subsidy is the plug number. Yeah. Yeah. And because there's a constant fuel cost at high oil prices, you make a higher return on renewable energy. So therefore, the difference in returns is actually negative. So a negative difference means you don't need subsidies. Yeah. Yeah. But yet, the subsidy scheme is either constant or rising as oil prices increases. So you're giving more money, more subsidies, at a time you don't need the subsidies. Now the flip side of that is during periods of low oil prices, that's a time you need more subsidies. Yeah, but because we pay the subsidy at a certain level on certain assumed oil prices, how would the subsidies regime work in that kind of environment? You actually need more. Yeah. So in the case of uh, mid metal geothermal or uh, onshore wind, you need roughly about between three and a half to four, four US cents per kilowatt hour of additional subsidy yeah. compared to what you have over there. Now it's about two and a half to three yeah, because you need about one cent per kilowatt hour. So, if you're an investor, would you put money in renewable energy at that point? You wouldn't, yeah. because the, the subsidy received is insufficient. Yeah. Yeah. So now, if we recall the green paradox, this is part of the explanation. Well, general subsidies, general support from policy, and policy acting as social capitalists does not work. Yeah. Because by the very nature of policy making, there is absolutely no flexibility, <coughs> and even the most flexible dynamic government around will probably find it so difficult to respond to changes in the market factors, like price. Yeah. Just imagine if you have the Department of Energy issuing every week a different subsidy rate. That probably creates so much confusion in the marketplace and say, well, you know, forget it. We're not taking these people seriously. Now, so how does this work in biofuels? So we've seen so far the, the biopower. Well, interesting concept about finite land, right? This is the problem in Latin America. This is a criticism in Africa. The exploitative capitalist system of the North yeah, is extracting all the goods from the poor, ignorant Africans and Latin Americans because we don't have enough land to produce enough feedstuff. Now, let's have some reality check. How much is agriculture versus the total land area? It's about a third in the most agricultural economies. In the more advanced economies, it's even, it's even smaller. Now, arable and permanently planted uh, areas versus total agricultural areas, we still have some slack. Some countries will probably be tighter. 
for example, Myanmar, who gave up, and Malaysia, who gave up 97 utilites. Well, Singapore, forget it. It's, too, it's hardly an agricultural country. But uh, where's the Philippines? So Philippines, about 87. So you have a bit of slack there. Now, let me, your chart here. This is uh, essentially looking at the impact on the biofuel feedstock cost yeah, as you introduce fuel applications into the food chain. Now, of course, the results are not surprising. Sugar cane, coconut, you know, would have, would have the biggest impact on consumption and the pricing. Yeah. But again, uh, correct me, let me if I'm wrong. Uh, this this model is uh, is operating in the context of an autarkic system, yeah. meaning in a closed system where you don't incorporate the tree component. Now, if you incorporate the tree, chances are those negative numbers would actually be a lot smaller, if not neutral. And of course, I wouldn't say that that is always true because it would depend on where the sugar prices will be or where the oil, uh, coconut oil prices will be. I think the moral of the story is when sugar prices are low, you probably have a refiner's market where you can get, get your feedstock from all over the world yeah, and you'll be locking all the way to the bank. But then the flip side is, if sugar prices are high as they are today, you probably have a bit of a problem. Yeah? Yeah. Now, if you do have a choice between producing for food or fuel, or better still, for food and fuel, then you've got flexibility. And surely there must be a value to that flexibility. Yeah. Now, so the low-hanging fruit really is on efficiency rather than subsidies. Because if we take sugar as an example, and we look at a few other crops here, Philippines and Malaysia would have the lowest productivity per hectare. And, um, you, know, you can argue whether, uh, whether production per hectare is the correct measure or not. Yeah, but for now, for this uh, discussion, Let's stick to that. So if the Philippines achieve a Vietnam style of productivity level, this market will probably produce enough feedstock to meet the food and fuel requirements. Now, if you find that a bit, if you find that to be a bit uh, ambitious, then let's just say, let's aim for, uh, for Indonesia. No, there's a specific reason for mentioning Indonesia and, and Vietnam yeah, because I remember about a year last year I published a paper which I hope I do not need to republish with a subtitle I told you so and what I basically said at the time is if we cannot get our act together at the policy front, and that starts to influence the kind of investment we're going to make. So in other words, the, the subtext of that message is, if we persist in cuddling the rent-seeking economic model that has been persisting in our country, then it will not take 40 years, as in 1986 to 1992, when China overtook the Philippines. Yeah. Hard to believe, right? It was as recent as 1986, China was well behind the Philippines in the development uh, scale. Yeah. It took China 14 years from 1986 to surpass the Philippines and continue to surpass the Philippines. Now, I would say, I hope I don't need to republish and say, I told you so. Within this presidency, Vietnam and Indonesia 
may overtake the Philippines. I said that in 1984. <laughs> no, I said that in... 2010. No, I said that in 1984. Ah, you said that in 84. <laughs> yes. So, the role of specialization and trade is probably something that's worth reminding us of. Now, this number called the relative competitive advantage, you know, we don't need to worry about how it's calculated or the mechanics behind that. You know, there are enough papers that you can refer to. All it simply says is it is a score, which is a positive number above one, then you're doing better than your peer group. If you happen to be below one, uh, you've got a bit of a problem because you're lagging behind. Now, interesting is looking at this uh, Looking at this comparison, the countries that specialize actually became so efficient in their production that their competitive advantage has actually improved over time. Now, this is not a static measure. This is actually a very dynamic measure. Now, unfortunately for us, we seem to be always operate within the zone I think the kind word for that, or the diplomatic term for that, is a zone of indifference. Yeah. Now, if you want to be blunt about that, is, I would say that is a zone approximating majority. Yeah. I think as a people, we're extremely tolerant. Pwede na yun. Okay on yan. So if you operate close to the soul of mediocrity, the outcome that we will have will always be a mediocrity kind of thing. So, <coughs> advocates of anti-globalization measures would say, let's close the borders. Let's aim for autarky. Then I would say, my response to that is, no, actually, no. Revive Adam Smith, Mary Maltes. An example is again sugar, because the aim for Antarctic fuels at the national level is actually giving you disastrous consequences. Why would American consumers be forced to pay almost three times for their bioethanol using sugar, and the Europeans, well, almost four times? but you can import that from Brazil. So that is one of the unique features of biofuels that does not exist in renewable <coughs> energy when it comes to policy support, which is erecting the trade barriers. <coughs> erecting trade barriers is like applying a CO2 tax. You raise the domestic price, against imported price, so that the cost advantage of Brazil, by the way, the, uh, the tariff for Brazil to the US is 54 cents yeah, per liter. So if you add 54 cents to 21 cents, then all of a sudden, the American national producers of ethanol would be lapping all the way to the bank. So aren't we great? We're cheaper than the Brazilians. <laughs> now, the diversity of the costs, I bring this up as an, in, as an intro to the next slide, which is now shifting to a, to a totally different uh, aspect, which may sound to be non economic but actually it has all the implications for economics, which is bureaucratic transparency. Bureaucratic transparency, I think, is a diplomatic term for corruption and bribery and inefficiency. Now, 
This is a cost base of the different technologies if you use US, uh, US data. Uh, the US data is applicable, roughly speaking, to the developed world because equipment costs, and, uh, roughly speaking, has become quite globalized. Yeah. That with the exception of land costs, that's about the differentiation uh, from one country to the other. Now, what I have done here is to say, what is the additional cost for the same technology if you want to uh, install the same capacity in a country which does not have institutional transparency, does not have the bureaucratic efficiency, yeah. and of course applying a factor of 1.5 times is probably just about right, yeah. although that's on the lower end yeah, of, the, of the estimates. Good example is geothermal in Europe would cost you about, and in the US would cost you about $2,000 per kilowatt hour in installed capacity. In Indonesia and the Philippines, you'll be lucky to get it installed at $3,000 per kilowatt hour, per kilowatt of installed capacity. Now, implications of that with the normalized cost, remember the levelized cost of energy? Those are the differentials. That's the additional cost that you will need to pay yeah, because of bureaucratic leakages. Now, this is another low-hanging fruit. If policy could concentrate yeah, on simplifying things yeah, and getting out of the role of being social entrepreneurs or social capitalists, and instead facilitate the permitting and the licensing process, then reducing the kilowatt hour cost by say even just one cent, US cents per kilowatt hour, that's a lot of money. In peso terms, four cents per kilowatt hour is about one 1.72 pesos per kilowatt hour. So you can figure it out. How much electricity you consume per day? Yeah. And that's the extra cost that you're paying because of bureaucratic linkages. Yeah. Now, so to take a look at the where do we go from here? So business schools, business school professors love about the four by four matrix. Yeah. Yeah, but because we are talking about policy and economics and how they interact, then we I prefer to look at it as an interacting process. So essentially you have policy tools influencing portfolio choices. So there is a feedback loop here the kind of mix that you will have, or the kind of technology that you will have. And whether you go down the route of taxation or you go down the route of subsidies, chances are the effects will be very similar with the exception of specific choices of technology. But then, you pay Mr. An of San Miguel Corporation to do the job, not to second guess, the Department of Energy, but you pay him for being to make the choices that would be appropriate for San Miguel and that would be appropriate for society. And the way they interlink is really on the bottom part where you have capital commitments and the welfare and income, wherein Economics has to deal with the kind of debt and the kind of equity that you want to inject, the kind of returns and the kind of risk that you can tolerate yeah, as a company, as an investor. And if you are successful in adventure, 
the employment creation and the raising of income, chances are, would follow. So, if we now start to group this together, we actually have have a framework that I could get us to focus on the things that we need to focus in our respective rules, roles in the economic system, which is, I will not aspire to be happy and seek happiness, but I'd rather aspire to do the things that are fulfilling because by doing the things that are fulfilling, chances are I would find happiness in that. So translating that is basically, if we aspire to maximize welfare and income, just like a person aspiring to be happy and to seek happiness at all costs, will actually end up very miserable. Yeah. But if we focus on the wealth creation yeah, that underpins the enhancement of welfare through income creation and employment creation, yeah, then we might have a better chance of moving forward. And at least that would also help me from rewriting the same article and republishing the same article with the subtitle, I told you so. Yeah. Instead of I told you so, the best article I hope to write in six years' time is how wrong I was. Okay, questions? Yeah. So no questions. These are some of the takeaways that I'd like to leave with you. Let's reframe the investment issue. This is not an either or proposition. The good fortune that the Philippines has is we are in the ASEAN. Although I guess you know some of you was probably familiar with some of the things that I've written in the past or has attended some of the presentations that I had. One of the things I, I say at times, of course jokingly, is that the Philippines is in Asia with geographic uh, accident because the Philippines has more in common with Latin America than Asia. But that's probably not a very flattering comparison. So I prefer to have the Philippines in the ASEAN and in Asia being the most dynamic, dynamic region where we are able to exploit the fuel, food, and trade as a portfolio opportunity. Now, we don't need to take a giant leap of faith to believe that we can make it not only in biofuels and bioenergy, but we can make a positive contribution to making the Philippines or transforming the Philippines from a laggard into a global leader by concentrating the low hanging fruits. Now, has any country ever come from behind and become the world leader? Yes. And the name of that country is a country we are very familiar with because they colonized this country for four centuries. And I remember 15 years ago as a banker, every time I make a presentation about, uh, about the European, uh, well at that time it was still the common market, and when I do some industry ranking and Spain comes out as number one or number two in some industries, there's always somebody out there in the back saying, wait a minute, there's something wrong with your chart. 
I said, oh, which one? He said, surely Spain cannot be, surely Spain cannot be the leader in that field. Said, well, at least nowadays, when I present the charts of the ranking table, when you put Spain as number one uh, as a leader in banking globally, telecommunications, construction, infrastructure, renewable energy, uh, just to name a few, then you say, well, this country has gone a long, long way from 1983 when that country was almost bankrupt. Not very different from probably some of the challenges we're facing now. <coughs> then, consequences is, and this is really where understanding the means and the consequences is what I'd like to do. Uh, I'd like to second guess our uh, friends here. Uh, many of them are from the biofuels uh, field. From a policy perspective, is the Philippines in the right direction? Uh, would you clarify <laughs> what the right direction means? Well, well it, it's, it's the kind of policies that have been put in place to promote uh, biofuels. Uh, well, yeah. well I, I have my own views about that, uh, which uh, I'm sure is a minority view. Mm. Uh, although a minority view that is becoming more openly heard yeah. after the uh, after the disaster and the scandal and the climate change uh, climate change data manipulation whether the Philippines is in the right track or not let's let me respond to that in a very specific way is the Philippines the right track to meet the 10% blend rate? Answer is no. Yeah. Is a 10% blend rate the right policy to have? Probably not. Yeah. So, what do we need changing? We probably need to focus more on picking our battles. What we love to have is to look at what seems to work in other countries and try to replicate that in the Philippines. Now, the reason it doesn't work is that countries like Brazil, which is probably the lowest cost bioethanol country, has spent about three decades on research and development to get to the point where they are. Now, the U.S. is so far behind. So I'd rather have a replacement of an autarkic kind of mentality into more of a technological innovation mentality. Meaning, I'd rather fund R&D and let technology development compete in the marketplace of ideas. That's the nature of policymakers. They're, they're, they're too uh, short-sighted. They, they want uh, fast results. Correct. Okay. <laughs> That's why it doesn't work. <laughs> uh, we, we, we want to achieve this much, and so therefore this is the shortest route towards that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, let's, so let's, let's give uh, uh, targets that uh, people will, will, will have to satisfy, and in doing so, we, we need subsidy. We need and so before you know it, you're no longer in the energy business. Yeah. You're in the rent extraction business. Yeah. And the rent extraction business simply bankrupts both the government and the private sector. Now, how much does it cost to subsidize a program? Yeah. Let, let, me, let me turn the table. Yeah. How much are we spending on subsidizing, uh, let's say, San Carlos? I don't know how much uh, subsidies San Carlos uh, bio, bioethanol uh, receives, but I suspect it's a sum of money that you could redeploy 
into research and development. Now, is there any hope for a country like the Philippines to be a technological leader? Well, I suppose, you know, I suppose if uh, we claim to have good universities, then uh, chances are we do not, have good capability. Not, not with the amount of money we are putting into R&D. Precisely. That's why if you shift and redeploy, the money directed for subsidies into R&D, you have a better chance. Now, is it always government as a source of funding? Probably not. Probably not. Because again, if we look at on the historical experience, the role of government in engineering the transitions in energy is actually very minimal. Yeah. The government has nothing to do with combustion engine. They have nothing to do with invention of cars. They have nothing to do with invention of airplanes. But these are the changes that drives human usage. Now, it's a hard pill to swallow, yeah, but I guess as Mao Zedong said, the journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step or something along that line. So if this is a 10 year, a 10 year journey, if we take the first step now, then chances are in 10 years' time, we'll be somewhere. Now, if the alternate scenario is, it takes 10 years to get things done, and we rely on band aid policy making, then what's the kind of end result that, that, we're, that we're getting? We're getting segments of three-year cycles of repeating the same mistakes that the previous uh, group has made. Yeah, I, I, I say one more. Uh, it seems to me that there is a more powerful group than the tenants in Malacanang. The in, tenants in Malacanang. Yeah, it seems that there is a, a more powerful group than the tenants of Malacanang in, say, setting up policies in the Philippines. It's just like uh, before in the U.S., the Wall Street group seems to be more powerful than those in the White House. Uh, that's, that's an interesting perspective, yeah, because uh, after spending most of my career in the city of London, and uh, although not directly at Wall Street, you know, I do visit Wall Street uh, every quarter. Mm -hmm. uh, it's almost a running joke, actually, during breakfast meetings. I said, well, Wall Street Journal saying, you know, we're such a bunch of powerful people that moves the market. I said, well, can somebody explain to me why we're losing money if we're moving the market? Yeah. So, let's, let's uh, I think we need to separate the facts and the fantasies. Yeah. Because the moment we start to uh, inject the fantasies into the thinking, then very clearly, the policy process becomes very muddled. Now, policy making is not a straightforward, it's not a straightforward process. <coughs> That's why politics is such an exciting uh, profession. In a good sense of the word. Because it's a recursive process as opposed to a linear process. Unfortunately, the way programs are designed and the way policies are designed is based on an assumption <coughs> that things move in a linear process, in a linear manner. Yeah. So therefore, by the time you get to the to year 10, you say, well, how come we're so far off? Yeah. So this is where the concept of flexibility comes in. Well, fortunately or unfortunately, with all the criticisms we may have about the market economy, the market is probably one of the few mechanisms that could respond dynamically yeah, to those uh, changes.
maybe I have to add also. Uh, a reality is uh, we are concentrating on crops that has been, uh, I'm re referring to by fewer crops like say sugar cane. The emphasis is always sugar cane. And uh, of course, whether we like it or not, it will be a food versus fuel. But here comes a crop that can answer both. Uh, a part of the plant will be for food and feed, and then the other product of that plant is for fuel. But uh, not so much is being spent for the R&D of this crop. In fact, right now we have zero from government. Which I'm glad you raised that, uh, that point, because I think on the paper you covered that, uh, that point. That, uh, if, uh, Value, uh, the value chain of our business. I think the relationship of traditional crops versus non-conventional biofuel crops is, us, is actually to look at what the role of sugar is or what the role is of coconut oil. As of now, those are the two biofuel feedstock that we have in abundant supply with some efficiency enhancement, the production could probably be increased substantially. So that's the first point. The second point is, you cannot create a market for biofuels if you don't make biofuel available. Yeah. And to make biofuel available and widely available, you have to rely on sugar and coconut. Now, in the in the interim, yeah, I totally agree with you. Research and development funding, either from the private sector or from the public sector, will have to be channeled to the non-food crop feedstock. Yeah, so that when they become widely available yeah, for deployment, you don't need to worry too much about whether there is a market or not. Yeah. So this is the bridging technology as I would refer to it. Yeah, yeah and I think uh, the, the other factor there yeah. that really models the, the real the scenario is the uh, way we uh, express uh, productivity, which is just mere uh, unit output per unit uh, area of production, I mean, per unit production area. I think we should also emphasize the time element. It should be uh, the production per unit time per unit area. Yeah. Say again, yeah. uh, in the crop that I was referring to, which produces both food and feed, uh, food and fuel, it's a short maturity crop. Per, uh, this is sorghum. Yeah, sweet sorghum. sorghum. And then compared to sugar cane, yeah. which takes uh, about three, three times the length of time, to uh, mature. Yeah. So which is where, you know, where you have the choices of feedstock that are available in the marketplace and you just allow them to compete with one another. Yeah. And that's where economists like maybe should be. Yeah. Because otherwise... Well, I, I think I said uh, enough favorable words for sweet sorghum already. <laughs> <laughs> no, because otherwise, otherwise we will end up in the same in the same paradox that we find in, re in renewable power or in, in, in wind, wind power. Yeah. That by picking up a champion today, hoping that we can project today's solutions to be the solution for tomorrow, and tomorrow is about 10, 20 years ahead. Yeah. And that's what Brazil has done, right? Then, then what happens with obsolescence? <laughs> now, well, Brazil's uh, Brazil's commitment to bioethanol has not been a very linear process. Well, uh, what I'm saying is they, they, they really betted on, on that. Uh, that's why they have put enough money to sugar uh, to achieve that. Uh, now, from the perspective today, looking back, yes, that's what happened in the end. Okay. 
But the way they've implemented the bioethanol program, it's been stop and start in the beginning mm -hmm. until they found their niche as well. Aside from cattle, what do we produce? Mm -hmm. yeah. We produce a lot of sugar. Mm -hmm. So what do we do with sugar? Yeah. So that's how that's how they, they evolve. And, uh, and of course, one advantage Brazil has over the Philippines, which is probably a more serious and dumb problem, is Brazil has given up the concept of land reform as an equity as an equitable measure of distributing uh, welfare. Yeah. And the Philippines is rather unique <coughs> in persisting on a failed program after 44 years, at least from my own reckoning. Although people would uh, probably dispute that and say, no, no, we've not been doing land reform for 44 years. We've actually been doing that only for, uh, you know, since, since Marcos. I said, no, fine, that's uh, still like, what, 30 years? So, so. Any more questions? <laughs>